You see that? Yes, I do. And what does it say under that? Pain policy studies groups state report cards on pain policy. Exhibit 16 is a set of emails with a deal with PKY 18340230. Down on the bottom, you see an email from Mike Neo at Cooney Waters following there? Yes. It's dated June 25th, 2008 at 348, isn't it? Yes. To Jim Hines? Yes. You know Jim Hines, right? I'm familiar with Mr. Hines, yes. Who's Jim Hines? I'm familiar with the name of Jim Hines. I don't recall who he is. Now, your PPSG report card was not intended by you to be of commercial value for Purdue, now was it? That was never an intent but, of the report card. You didn't want Purdue to use that in an effort to monetize its oxycontin or other opioid products, don't you? No, we developed that as a tool to help states improve their policies. In fact, you didn't want them to go and take your report card and try to assess a commercial value to the regulatory policies of the state that was included in the report card. Thank you. At least you're not yelling at me. I'm sorry, I was startled. You did not want Purdue to go and take your report card and use that to assess a commercial value for the regulatory policies in place in any state covered by that report card. Did you? I'm sorry, I don't know what that means. You don't need a commercial value. To assess the amount of money they could make from a commercial standpoint in a state as a result of whether that state had restrictive or less restrictive policies regarding Schedule II narcotics for the use of pain medication. That's certainly my intent. That would have been wrong. I would not have approved of that. And why would you have approved that? Because our tool was meant for education and, and for outreach. And it was a research product. And it wasn't meant to be used by manufacturers. You didn't want Purdue to use it, did you? I can't help who uses the report, but our intent was not to have it become a tool um, of industry. And your intent wasn't, when you say it, your intent wasn't for it to be a tool for industry, you're including Purdue as part of that industry, right? I would say it was a tool for, for any, any pharmaceutical manufacturer. Including Johnson & Johnson? Yes. Including Tabla? Yes. Including Cephalon? That is true. Including Endo? Yes. All right, let's go to the bottom of this. Says, hi Jim, we reviewed the top line overview from the Payment Policy Support Group, DPSG 2008 Progress Report Card, and see an opportunity to publicize the new findings to consumer audiences. Beyond the press release, that we assume PPSG will issue as a way to, and then it has bullets. You see that? Yes. Well, let's just start there. An opportunity to publicize the new findings to consumer audiences, right? That is true. Capture positive media coverage for pain, chronic pain, right? Yes. Reinforce the value of the need for opioid medications, right? An advanced discussion about the measures consumers can take to improve pain management and highlight barriers to effective care in some states, right? Yes. Then it says, we recommend a targeted radio media tour featuring Aaron Gilson to generate consumer attention. You see that? Yes. And it uses that word, consumer, doesn't it? Yes. Generate, that's their word, isn't it? Yes. Attention, that's their word, isn't it? Yes. Then it goes on to say, we need a, well, that's not words. It says in bold and underlined, suggested media hook. That's their words, right? Yes. And it says the perennial C states, doesn't it? Yes. It says that after reviewing the progress report cards for 2000 to 2008, we noticed that 13 states have not improved or only slightly improved their C grade 
since PPSG started monitoring eight years ago. It says that, doesn't it? Yes, sir. Then it says of the 13, there are seven states that we have identified with the most potential media opportunities. You see that? Yes. And then under the bold, underlined, suggested media hook headline, it says something else, doesn't it? It yes. says, we think there's a compelling pitch here, doesn't it? Oh, yes. And now it puts that, what follows, in italics. Would you please read the following quote for the jury? Yes. Well, there's been steady progress overall. Some states have been stuck in with C grades since PPSG first began monitoring pain policy almost a decade ago. X, Y, Z, etc. And the price for the consumer public is suffering with no end in sight. There's that word again, consumer, right? Yes. It goes on to suggest we would book radio interviews in cities in each of our seven target states to talk about the implications of the 2008 progress report. It says that, doesn't it? Yes. And then it says, and prepare Aaron to offer one to two customized suggestions on what each of the seven states need to do to improve and how a C grade affects people battling chronic pain, right? That is true. And then it says, here are the seven target C states, doesn't it? Yes. And there's a list, isn't there? Yes. And in that list is one that starts with an O, isn't it? Yes. What is that state? Oklahoma. Oklahoma. Thank you. And as we saw from the previous exhibit, exhibit 16, sir, Jim Hines did, in fact, say that he spoke to you, right? Yes. July 9, 2008 is quite a bit after the email we were just looking at in Exhibit 16, isn't it? Less than a month later. And he says, spoke to Aaron. He is on board. What it says, doesn't it? To discuss our policy report card with people? Yes. Yes. Now, Purdue's not the only one that used your report card, is it? Not aware. Well, you said you wasn't your intent for industry to use this report card for its own monetary purposes, right? You said that earlier. Our intent was making it, that's correct. But they sure did, didn't they? Didn't they? They used it as a tool, yes. And you, can you mark as a to the 17? This is a March 11, 2008 document for the record. It's got a date stamp that's not on the native file. J-A-N-N-S-0044-2778. This document is titled Pain Policy Overview, March 11, 2008. You see that? Yes. You stated earlier, it was not your intent for industry to use your report cards as a tool to make money, right? That is correct. You feel like it would be wrong for them to use these report cards as a way to try to make money off of the state? That should not be the intent of the use of that, that tool. That would be a bastardization of what you wrote this report for, wouldn't it? That was not the intent of that report. So right here, when you look at this document from Jansen, Johnson, Johnson, it has a whole page dedicated to pain policy studies group, and it says promoting pain relief by improving public policy and communication. Did you see that? Yes. And on one side it says, has a picture of the 2007 progress report card, and on the other side it has a picture of the guide to evaluation. You see that? Yes. Let's turn the page. There we've got a map depicting the United States of America, correct? That is correct. And it has various states color shaded by grade, correct? Yes, it does. And this is not a geography question. Do you know where Oklahoma is on the map? Yes. Did you see that? Yes. Okay. Your report card gave a grade of a C or C plus 
to go home, correct? Uh, yes. And this J&J or Janssen document, it has a bolded headline. What does it say? Extracting value from the state of war cards. It's not my word of it. No, I don't believe it is. But it does say extracting value, doesn't it? Yes, it does. And then it has a bold bulleted point that says symbol translation of key points to physicians. You see that? Yes. Was it your intent when you wrote these report cards for Johnson & Johnson or Janssen to take your report card and engage in a translation of points to physicians? In fact, I believe we had translated recommendations for physicians within the tools themselves, so no, it was not. This says analyze C2 and C3 prescribing by state and compare trends in opioid prescribing with changes in state regulations to determine potential correlations, both positive and negative, as it relates to prescribing behavior. Right? That's what it says. And then it says what? Identify a commercial value to each state. And then it says what? Where to focus our efforts. And then it says what? Are there hot spots to watch? That is not what you intended to do report cards to be used for as it sir. No, it is not. And you said on the pain care form with J&J, didn't you? I was a member of the pain care form. None of those companies ever told you, did they? That they were using your report to try to achieve commercialization of value based on that report? Yeah. How does that make you feel? I would rather not have known that. It was synthetic. I mean, of course, you can't control how people use your, use your, the tools that you provide, the research that you conducted. Well, there's a way to control it. If you don't like what somebody's doing, you can disassociate yourself. That is correct. It was what? Oh, you want to say something else? Awesome I, I didn't know the extent to which this was being used in that capacity. Okay, you to the 23, sir. This is a document. Produced by Janssen. Zero zero four nine four nine two nine. Just going to go over some names here. This document lists medical science liaison report for medical affairs analgesia analgesia February two thousand four. You see that? Yes. And what do you understand KOL to mean? In this context, it, it could be key opinion leader. And in the fourth row, the list of KOL, J. Dahl, you see that? Yes, I do. Tell the jury who that is. Please. Professor Dahl is a retired uh, pharmacology professor uh, at the University of Wisconsin. She was a colleague of yours? Yes, we worked together. You worked together in that 2000 general article that we talked about earlier today? Yes. Here it says, congratulated her on a recently published article in the Journal of Pain. She shared information regarding her upcoming Medicare presentation with me. It goes on to say, apparently she is going to try to reshape Medicare regarding pain as she did J-C-A-H-O with the fifth vital sign. You see that? Yes. You do know what it means when it refers to her work on the fifth vital sign, right? I don't know who took these notes, but technically the fifth vital sign is not an initiative, an initiative within the Joint Commission. It was separate. How so? That it was uh, coined by the American Pain Society. And the Joint Commission required that pain be treated by the vital sign. Required that pain be assessed and treated. Yes. By the vital sign. Yes. Correct. But you're, you're not a medical doctor, but you're familiar with vital signs. Yes. What are What's a vital sign? Blood pressure. What else? Pulse. What else? I'm not a doctor. Uh, 
are purely objective data driven science, right? They're physiological, yes. This is a thermometer, we can determine temperature, correct? Yes. We put a cuff on and a machine and we can determine blood pressure, correct? Correct. Pain is subjective. So far, yes. There is no data driven monitor to assess pain. <clears throat> that is correct. Pain is not, in fact, a vital sign. Pain is not measured in the same way as other vital signs. It cannot be. Can. At this point, it can't be right. And it never has been able to be before today. Here to four. So at no time in history has pain been able to be measured as an objective, data-driven vital sign. That is correct. Now, the skull was paid by Purdue to be a speaker bureau presenter, correct? Yes. She became an influential key opinion leader regarding the work of the Joint Commission and pain as a good policy, correct? She was recognized for her for her efforts with the Joint Commission standards. Including pain as a good vital sign. That is not part of the Joint Commission standards, to my, to my knowledge. But it was absolutely leveraged. Fine. I'll agree with that. We'll come back to that in a moment. Now, this also is uh, Mr. Jorgensen. Can you see that? Yes. He's listed as a KOL here, correct? That is correct. Uh, if you go to the next page, sir, please. Yes. Dr. Cleveland and MD Anderson. Yes. Uh, you, University of Wisconsin, didn't have a relationship at some point with Dr. Cleveland? That is correct. You saw how Jansen was using your art. As you said, out of context, to tell us field force how to go talk to doctors. You saw that with your own eyes, didn't you? Yes. You know that people are dying as a result of the opioid crisis in this country, don't you? Yes, they do. It's tragic, isn't it? Of course it is. How do you feel to learn that secretly, behind office doors that were closed and locked, your name and your company was being put into papers like this for the purpose of promoting their drugs? And you were never told that. I just have to take solace in the intent that we had in producing those tools. But how do you feel to know that they took whatever your intent was and manipulated it for their own commercial purposes? I disappoint. I don't know if you're going to come to Oklahoma and sit in front of a jury and tell people the truth, but we're going to take this case to trial. And we're using this camera right here to record your testimony and present it back to you. This is your chance. Tell this jury how you feel to see what you've seen today. How these companies have used your company, and your organization, your university, your life support. How do you feel to know what's going on behind this lock over here? This is your chance. Tell them. Well, tell me there's a lot of people out there who think you're responsible for part of this. This is your chance. What would you like to say? I just began with the belief that we could inure ourselves against the influence of pharmaceutical companies and indeed anti-funders through the university's unrestricted educational grants because it mandated that any funder could direct your activity. They couldn't make you do things, which is why we tried to do all of our policy research work through project funds. And that's, that just isn't true. That any association with industry can reflect poorly on anyone who does work within the pain management field because of that association. And I'm sorry that this is on our mind. The, it, the credibility that we had, that this work was supposed to entail. This was policy research done by, started by someone who foremost importance professionally 
was to ensure that medications wouldn't be abused in the brain. He came and formed this group because of that, believing that you could make medications available for legitimate medical uses without sacrificing their abuse in the brain. And it's disappointing that that has been compromised. Compromised by entities that have used this outside of its intent. I can put the names here not, but I think you can do it on your own. Who are they? Three of them are in this room. Who compromised the integrity of what you tried to do and what you're intent? Who did it? Well, it would really be any pharmaceutical manufacturer that, it, that attempted to do that. Or do? They attempted it. Johnson and Johnson. Let's look at 991. What does the top of 991 say, sir? Proposed target KOLs and for PPR communications. There's a lot of people listed there, aren't there? Yes. A lot of friends of yours. A lot of colleagues. Yes. Jim Dahl's listed. Yes. David Jordan's listed. Yes. Aaron Dilson's listed. Yes. Did you ever know that internally inside the corporate headquarters of Purdue, they listed you and your colleagues here at the University of Wisconsin as targets? Did you know that? No. Did you ever know how far off the street has been? No. You know, I've never met before. Right? No. We have a great relationship. Do we? No. I'm not paying you a dime to be here, am I? No. You're no. here as being compelled by subpoena to be with your attorney motion. You did nothing for being here, did you? That's correct. You've been here all day, haven't you? Yes. I'm the first person in the 20 years you've been doing this who's ever shown me what they were doing inside the court walls with your name. Right? Yes. It took the attorney from the state of Oklahoma to tell you the truth about how you were being used by these companies. It's okay. You can answer. I had no understanding of this. Uh, you have no understanding of the scope and the magnitude or the complexity of how these drug companies were using the work that you and your friends and your colleagues around the country were doing to you. No. No. The answer was no. We now have a crisis, correct? Correct, but I also want to say that it has been important for the PPSG to um, to identify the need for efforts to mitigate abuse and diversion of these medications to avoid this this uh, this loss of life. That didn't work. The outcome suggests that it has not worked. We shouldn't give up, should we? Of course not. We're in a fight to try to stop this crisis of it, right? Yes. It can be done. Does that help? Yes. And we should do anything it takes to stop it. We should be considering our responses so that we can be most effective in stopping it. Yes. And to stop a crisis, you have to understand what the crisis is. What it is, why it is. Including yes. what caused it. Right? That's correct. That is correct. And each one of us, would you agree, has an obligation to do his or her part to solve this crisis? To the extent that our uh, professional affiliations and activities allow that, absolutely. How old are you, sir? 52. You have a family? Yes. If you have the ability to do something, no matter how big your house is, to abate this crisis. You should do whatever you can to do it, right? I would agree. That doesn't just apply to you, it applies to any person in this country. I would agree that we should take the opportunities that we have 
before us to, to mitigate this crisis. Yes. And that applies to people in the state of Oklahoma as well. Nationally and internationally. Including the state of Oklahoma. Yes. If you have the ability to do anything at all, no matter how big or small, to put this crisis to an end, you got to stand up and do what you can, right? Thank you. Something we have to do, correct? Yes. We have a moral obligation as human beings to do it. Yes. At any point in time, to your knowledge, did the Pain Care Forum establish a committee for the purpose of helping to abate the opioid crisis in America? Would that count efforts like the RAMS program, which actually was a tool to abate abuse and delivery? While you were involved, did you ever see a committee that was organized or established for the purpose of abating the opioid crisis with that stated mission or purpose? And has the Pain Care Forum acted jointly to take steps to evade the opioid crisis? Not as a single activity to my knowledge. You could testify that the intent of the PBSG and your work in the PBSG was to. You previously testified that the intent of the PPSG and your work in the PPSG was to educate, correct? That is and who were you trying to educate in that role? In, in where? As part of your role at PBSG, yes. who were you trying to educate? Oh, uh, we were trying to educate uh, medical regulators, uh, healthcare practitioners, and patients. And so doing, you produced a lot of materials, you were a speaker, uh, other members of the PBSG were speakers, correct? We presented at national conferences and state conferences. And you worked in concert with other groups to create things um, such as uh, model guidelines? Yes, most of our activities were multidisciplinary collaboratives. Yes. And again, those multidisciplinary collaboratives were for education purposes? Uh, Research purposes, educational purposes, communications, yes. When you perform research, that was with the hope to use that research to educate the parties you just mentioned, correct? That is true. Now, that holds true for your work with the World Health Organization as well? That same principle we carry over, yes. So if somebody takes your educational materials, information you disseminate through presentations, and passes that on to other healthcare providers, to other organizations, to other policymakers, that fulfills your goals, correct? But that would be consistent with the intent. So if a manufacturer were to take materials that you created and pass them out to healthcare professionals, that would be in accordance with the intentions of why you created those materials, correct? If it were being done for educational or communicative purposes, yes. And we discussed many subjects today. Have any of those subjects made you question any of the materials that you prepared as part of the PBSG? Any of the uh, research-based tools that we, that we constructed? Question what aspect? Uh, the truthfulness, the veracity, the accuracy of any of the materials that PDSG has put together and disseminated. No. So you stand by everything that the PDSG did from its inception to when you left? The materials that we developed reflected what we perceived as accurate um, for the topic that we were examining, yes. And you still stand by those today, correct? 
at work for the time that they want to, that they want to develop here. So, Mr. Beckworth showed you numerous internal documents from several of the manufacturers or defendants in this action, correct? Yes. Did any of those internal documents change any of your opinions about the veracity and truthfulness of the PPSG documents, materials, and speakers that were reflected in those documents? No. I would, I would, I would amend that by saying that putting someone from the University of Wisconsin under a patient advocacy label would, would be inconsistent with the university policy, but that's, that's it. And to the extent that the PPSG received unrestricted educational grants from any of the defendant manufacturers, did any of those unrestricted educational grants affect the outcome of any of the PPSG's research? No. Did it affect any of the speakers or presentations from the PPSG to various healthcare organizations or policymakers? Do you mean it affect the messages? No. Thank you. And in fact, that's a requirement to accept those grants, correct? Is that there would be no influence by any funder uh, who provides an unrestricted educational grant. That's correct. There could be no influence to the output, correct? That is correct. There doesn't have to be an output, correct? Deliverables are not necessary. And if something was delivered, the intellectual property would belong to the University of Wisconsin and not to uh, whoever gave the unrestricted education grant, correct? That's correct. So, in terms of the grants that, that uh, PPSG or I have received, yes. So, if a grant was straight, I'm going to turn really quickly to the question of addiction. And if you could please revisit Exhibit 4, which was an excerpt. Pain management. 
there wasn't an ethics test. One of those things, other than the excerpt from chapter four, we're showing to you today, where the tests are. So we can read those excerpts from the record, can we? Not as a result of this. No. So just going to these guidelines, the board adopted criteria for evaluating the physician's treatment of pain, including the use of controlled substances, correct? That is correct. And the first one is evaluation of the patient. Is that also called assessment? Yes. So what goes into assessment? Well, I am not a physician. Um, With that caveat, of course. But it is my understanding that assessment, uh, a thorough assessment would include an evaluation of the biopsychosocial factors uh, influencing their patient's treatment. And that would vary from patient to patient? The findings would vary from patient to patient, yes. Would that be in the form of a checklist, Dr. Uh, Chekhov, one, two, three? Or would it be more of a holistic analysis? There are uh, standardized assessment forms that are used for certain uh, psychosocial characteristics. Um, but I believe that in general practice, it tends to be a, a very uh, random individual uh, process. And number two is treatment plan. Yes. So what goes into a treatment plan? Uh, a determination of various approaches and modalities that would be used to uh, to provide that treatment. Is there a set, of, set list of treatment plans? You know, will we use treatment plan A or D or what do you do? Or are they also individualized? Uh, they, they do tend to be individualized. And in fact, the purpose of this um, responsible opioid prescribing book was to provide much more detail and guidance regarding those issues. So you can't just check off boxes and determine if the plan is okay or not. That, that is true, but it wouldn't surprise me if many physicians do just that. If many physicians do just that, would they be misdiagnosing or misprescribing? There, there would be, uh, I think it would be determined that there would be a higher likelihood of misdetermining or misprescribing. And so that would be prescribing. And that would be caused by the doctor, correct? The, by the prescriber, yes. The prescriber. And number four was informed consent and agreement for treatment. I'm just reading on page 131. The physician should discuss the risks and benefits of the use of controlled substances with the patient. Is that correct? Yes. The physician fails to discuss the risks and benefits of the use of controlled substances. They would not be in compliance with the guidelines, correct? That is my understanding. And number four would be periodic review, correct? Yes. Oh, let me just back up. Is medical records documentation part of the evaluation of a patient? Um, it, for the purpose of the Federation's model uh, guidelines and policies, they've separated out medical records from, from that. But it, it, medical records is a kind of uh, flows through all parts of this. Yes. The doctor needs to have accurate medical records to make sure that they're prescribing properly, correct? That's the only way that the appropriateness of treatment can be determined is through the medical records. They need to have access to medical records from perhaps other prescribers. They need to have access to medical records from perhaps other prescribers that the patient has seen, correct? Uh, that would give them additional beneficial information. If the patient is intentionally seeing more than one doctor to hide the medical records, that could result in misdiagnosis, correct? It could result in an incomplete picture of the patient that might influence the treatment. And the medical records would also reveal if the patient has other prescriptions that are maybe contraindicated for the pain medication, correct? They, they should be. Yes. We were on periodic review. That's follow up visits with the patient, correct? Yes. And that involves inquiring into their activities of daily living, correct? Yes. Determining 
whether or not the patient is still uh, doing well on the medications or treatments provided. So there are any adverse effects? Yes. Or adverse behaviors, correct? That's right. And there's, I guess, long term to that is monitoring the patient? Yes, that's, that's the essence of the periodic review. And it's incumbent upon the practitioner if things are identified during that process to reconsider the treatment or reconsider modifications to the treatment. Yes. Is it fair to say that the practitioner is the last best line of defense against the use of opioids in this instance? In, the ter in terms of the clinical situation, yes. Can we discuss briefly, maybe you mentioned that there's a problem with opioids being misprescribed in this country, correct? Yes. And misprescription of drugs happens when these guidelines don't take place between the physician and the patient, correct? I think it would be accurate to say that the more a practice fails to conform to the guidelines, the greater likelihood there is for uh, adverse uh, consequences of treatment. I believe you mentioned earlier, after Mr. Beckworth asked you a question, what percentage of PPS use work relates to opioids? Remember that? Yes. And I believe it was in excess of 75%, correct? Yes. Does that figure in excess of 75, in excess of 75 percent include efforts to reduce the misprescription of opioids? I, I would say that yes, that, that would. And does that in excess of 75 percent? include efforts to address diversion or study, excuse me, sorry, is that in excess of 75 percent include efforts to combat or study the effect of diversion of opioids in America? Yes, it does. Is that in excess of 75 percent include efforts to promote the PPSG's mission of balance in opioid policies in the United States of America? In, in all types of pain policies, yes. Um, I mentioned the United States of America, but it's actually beyond that, correct? Right? It's international? The PPSG did have a, an international program, yes. Yes. 
And from what kind of instances are drugs diverted? There can be any number of instances. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, <clears throat> thefts from manufacturers and distributors. Uh, distributors setting up illicit relationships with pharmacies. Uh, a a uh, healthcare practitioner who's pilfering the medication. Uh, to give just a few examples. And those examples led, uh, can lead to the proliferation of opioids in the country. Yes, they actually contribute to the increased availability. Diverting medications are part of the amounts that are sold at the retail level. And are diverted drugs, excuse me, diverted medications more or less likely to be abused than prescribed medications? They have the same abuse potential. Well, we earlier discussed that abuse can be reduced through following the guidelines between the prescriber and the patient, right? That is true. So if there is no prescriber and patient abuse, Medications are instead diverted. Are they more or less likely to be abused? Well, I, I think well, I clarified that we're talking about just in the clinical situation. Outside of the clinical situation, I think it's a, it's a different it's a different issue. Can you can you please rephrase or rephrase your question more? Sure. Just sure. We discussed that the guidelines are. Um, effective ways to reduce misprescription of prescription opioids. Yes. Prescription opioids that do not go through the physician-patient relationship. Yes. Those are being taken without educating patients, correct? Sure. Without sure. somebody controlling dosage, correct? And the intent of it being taken is usually for the illicit purpose. So, yes. So, in that instance, they're already being misused, right? So, coming back to my original question, are diverted medications more or less likely to be abused than prescribed? Um, that diversion contributes significantly to the opposite use of prescription medications, yes. And part of the physician patient relationship, I think we mentioned earlier, was to prevent two drugs that are contraindicated for each other from causing, uh, I guess, an overdose or a bad result, correct? Yes. Is that what's known as polysubstance or polydrug use? Yes, I, I, I'm most familiar with the use of that term when talking about the use of multiple illicit substances. Um, so within the illicit use area, but that would certainly, that does certainly seem to characterize its use within a medical context also. So, can you take out Exhibit 12? Mm -hmm. Increase unintentional medication overdose deaths in order to Just looking on the first page, the conclusion, the unintentional medication-related deaths increasing in Oklahoma and often involve multiple substances, correct? Yes. And is that would you understand the poly substance or poly drug use? Yes. And I'm going to the fourth page on this page of the little uh, 360. It's kind of hard to see because of the staple. It's in the left hand corner. Yes. It's still on the business chart. Mm -hmm. If you look on the bottom right hand side, uh, the last full paragraph, 
the third sentence notes that methadone was involved in the highest number of deaths in Oklahoma, correct? That's what it says to say. We go to the next page. Again, on the right hand side, the last full paragraph, the first sentence notes that the majority of deaths in the analysis presented here were attributed to concurrent ingestion of multiple substances, correct? So during the time period 1994 to 2006, most deaths in Oklahoma came from poly drug or poly substance abuse, correct? It came from poly substance use. I don't know what it means. Thank you. And in that same paragraph, just going down, I think that this goes to what you're saying. It also notes that in certain instances, levels of any one medication involved in poly substance overdoses. Sorry. Uh, start over. In certain instances, levels of any one medication involved in poly substance overdoses might not have been lethal. However, taking, taking medication in combination with other prescription drugs, over-the-counter medications, illicit drugs, or alcohol, contributed additive side effects that were fatal. Is that correct? Yes, that is an acknowledged danger of poly substance use. And so, taking any one of the substances listed in the table two on that page, in conjunction with other prescription drugs, over-the-counter medications, illicit drugs, or alcohol, can cause a lethal combination, correct? Yeah. And as far as prescription drugs or over-the-counter medications goes, it's the responsibility of the pharmacy and the prescribing physician to make sure that those harmful interactions don't occur, correct? That, that is the case. I mean, it's, it's difficult because for the counter medication, they have to rely on those reports from the patient, and oftentimes those reports may be negative. So for some of the counter medications, and certainly for illicit drugs and alcohol, it's the patient's responsibility to not cause those interactions, correct? For, for enhanced safety, it would be important for the patient to relay to the prescriber that he or she is taking the medication. Yes. So it's the patient's responsibility to tell the prescriber, I am taking illicit drugs. Oh, uh, illicit drugs? Um, I mean, that, that would be the case. I'm not sure of the extent to which patients are willing to disclose that information. I'm going to the next page with these colored uh, graphs. Uh, again, the last full paragraph on the right, just the first sentence. On the basis of these findings, recommendations are that healthcare providers, pharmacists, and injury prevention professionals educate the public about the potential dangers of prescription medication. Is that the recommendation from the study as you read it? That provides a context for the series of recommendations that it provides. Yes. It goes on, but I didn't. Yes. The foods. Recommend, the recommendations that are provided relate to the context of educating the public about the potential dangers of prescription medications. Yes. Now, Mr. Beckworth also showed you the Presidential Commission uh, document, at least he showed you part of it, I believe. Do you recall that? Yes. And he cut it off right at page 21. Do you recall that? I did notice that it wasn't complete. He cut it off right in the segment of causes of the opioid crisis. Do you recall that? What number is that? Yeah, what number? Number 26. And so your question was? The question was, that was 
cut off right in the middle of causes of the, the excuse me, the section is called contributors to the current crisis. Okay. Origins of the current crisis is the section. The last section that's cut off from which they're And on that last page, the first bullet point you see there is rogue pharmacies and unethical prescription prescribing, correct? Yes. And that's what we've been talking about. That's diverted opioids and misprescribed opioids, correct? That's, those are examples of diverted yes. Okay. And you don't have it in front of you, but there are other causes listed by the President's Commission. Are you aware of that? I'm aware that there are is more than this report. Are you aware that you're cited in this report with your articles? I did not. No. Uh, I'll, I'll let you know you are cited when it comes to uh, the importance of the pharmacies properly, pr properly dispensing of opioids. Just something for you. Are you aware of a single medically inappropriate prescription written as a result of the distribution of your research? I don't know. I don't know how I would know that. Uh, no. In Oklahoma? No. Anywhere? No. Nobody's come to you and said, this prescription is inappropriate because somebody read one of your articles. This talk at the top says American Pain Foundation Board of Directors Conference Call, June 26, 2009. Exhibit 34, is that correct? Correct. Yeah, just want to make sure we're talking about the same thing. And as mentioned before, you, according to this document, you are not a part of this conference call. Is that correct? That's correct. Um, if you flip over on page three. Yes. It says the PCF has developed a congressional strategy whereby a letter will be sent to various key members of Congress. Yes. Do you know if any such letters were ever sent? Do you know of any members of Congress that would just rubber stamp a letter from any of the organization referenced in here? I do Thank you for that. Earlier, the plaintiff's counsel made a statement, and I think I have this very, but this is the gist of if I don't have it specifically correct. It says, quote, a lot of people think you are responsible for part of this. Did he ever show you any evidence that anyone thinks you are responsible for the misuse of any opioids? He did not present any evidence today that he could suggest. Do you know of anyone who suffers or has suffered from addiction to opioids as a result of anything you have done for failing to?
together is not that shorthand about the opioid crisis in the state of Oklahoma, is there? And did you know that in Oklahoma, 4.2 percent of all babies born to Medicaid mothers come into this world with neonatal abstinence syndrome? Did you know that? I knew that the rates were increasing across the nation. Did you know that in 2008, there were 74 Medicare-covered babies in the state of Oklahoma born with neonatal abstinence syndrome? They were, they were asking questions about my use of the opioid traditional report. And I explained to you as I handed you the copy that it was a partial copy, correct? That's correct. Now, of course, it's very voluminous. There's a lot of exhibits, correct? That's correct. And you told us, you told us, Drew, that you read the whole thing, correct? Thank you, Mom. Yeah. Correct. Now, sounds to me like the drug company lawyer wants to blame everybody but the drug company. Did it sound that way to you? I interpreted that as attempting to identify the multiple causes that were included in the report. There's one cause that drug company lawyer didn't try to identify. Right? It seemed to me that he was identifying those that had not yet been identified. He sure didn't try to identify the conduct of opioid manufacturers, right? That was not mentioned. Wasn't intended to be mentioned, was it? No. Now, he said something about blaming the doctors. Doctors prescribe opioids, right? Yes, they do. But who makes the opioids they prescribe? That would be the manufacturers. And who targeted those doctors with Salesforce personnel about prescribing opioids? As evidenced by some of the exhibits to say today, being in manufacturers. The drug companies, right? Right. That is correct. What's sitting right here is the lawyers representing them, right? That's correct. Okay. Now, we heard that pharmacies were to blame. Did you know that pharmacies got targeted by these drug companies too? Did you know that? Pharmacy? No. Did you know that? The sales reps that got compensated with bonuses by J and J and Teva and Cephalon and Purdue only got bonuses as the prescriptions they're targeted to doctors wrote about them. Did you know that? Did you know that? I wasn't aware of that situation. Who could fill a prescription? A pharmacist. Or a doctor can give out a sample, right? I don't believe the doctor can get out samples of Schedule 2 medication. That's right. But what they did to get around it was they gave those doctors discount cards so that when patients went to the pharmacy, they could get their drugs cheaper. Did you know that? You get it right. I am aware of the use of those types of cards, yes. And we also heard questions that intended to say that patients were at fault, right? Yes. If a patient's prescribed an opioid by a doctor and he goes to get it filled at a, at a pharmacy, who makes that opioid? The manufacturer. Could I get a prescription Schedule II narcotic in this country that was made by Purdue or Johnson & Johnson or Cephalon if they hadn't actually made the drug? I get the machine no. Do you believe that the three companies that are sitting here representing this case had some responsibility in causing this opioid crisis? Any whatsoever? That is the motivation of your involvement in this case. And I'm asking you, what do you think? You've been doing this a long time. You've been in this field a long time, right? Right? Yes. You know there's opioid crisis, right? Yes. Do you think the manufacturers of the prescription opioids in this country bear any fault or responsibility for the crisis that we find ourselves in? It seems to me that the exhibits raise some issues that need to be clarified. They raise issues that suggest responsibility. That suggests some level of involvement. You know, that, that completes the testimony of Dr. Gilson. Um, we might suggest we just stop now and then we'll call a live witness at 1.30 if that works. Sure, that'd be great. Okay. Thank you, sir.
Thank you. We will uh, stop now and resume the trial again at 1.30.